Hi, this is Jillian York, um, and I'm here for this week's Interrobang with our special guest, Marianne Franks. Uh, Marianne is an associate professor of law at the University of Miami School of Law and the vice president of the Cyber Civil Rights Initiative. Um, welcome. Thank you. Happy to be here. <laughs> thanks for thanks for coming on. Um, so we were going to kick off this conversation um, by talking about an article that was published this week by Amanda Hess um, in Pacific Standard called Why Women Aren't Welcome on the Internet, which is a topic I think we both agree is absolutely true. <laughs> right. That sounds great. Um, where would you like to start? So, yeah, um, I mean, I, you know, I read this article and, um, you know, a couple of people had pointed it out to me um, because there was a a bit of criticism of the organization I work for. And I guess I should point out before we go uh, into this that I am not representing EFF in this conversation and I'm not a lawyer. So, um, you know, anybody listening out there, I don't want anyone to get the wrong idea. So, um, so there, you know, there was that little criticism of us in there. And so I ended up reading the article and I found myself largely agreeing with what was said. I mean, I, you know, I guess I know you do a lot of work um, in this area and particularly in trying to um, build legislation. And so I'd kind of just be curious, you know, for our audience, if they might not be as familiar with your work, um, if you could give us a rundown of, of what you're working on so that we could, you know, kind of dive in with, with them uh, having the same level of knowledge. Yes, I'd be happy to. So what I've been working on, you could really characterize it as sort of a larger project and a kind of sub project within that. The larger project is something I've been doing for several years, along with other uh, law professors. Daniel Citron at Maryland is one of them trying to point out or give some descriptive heft to the idea of online harassment and what it means, what the consequences are, and trying to think about ways that the law can be used to help do something about the problem of online harassment, although not just limiting it to a legal response, but emphasizing the fact that our laws have not really done a very good job of trying to address the issue. And within that larger category of online harassment, I've been working a lot, again, with Professor Citron and others, on the specific issue of revenge porn, as it's popularly known, which is the non-consensual disclosure of someone's intimate images, usually in an effort to harm them or harass them, but sometimes with just the aim of getting some notoriety on the internet or just for fun or whatever the case may be. So what we've tried to do as part of this organization that I work for, the Cyber Civil Rights Organization, we're trying to get people to understand the phenomenon of online harassment, what it really means, and what it costs individuals. And at the same time, we're also trying to advocate for legal change where necessary. So right now, as Amanda has, has really nicely described in her essay, there are so many ways in which women especially, I mean, there's obviously all sorts of problems with online harassment that don't just have to do with women, but if we look at the, the kind of harassment that women have experienced, there's this huge problem where there doesn't seem to be anybody who's responsible for it or who will respond to it. If you go to the police, they tell you it's not really real. If you try to go to the social platforms that are facilitating or at least hosting this kind of conduct, they say it's not really our problem either. And so you really have a lot of people who are left with what can amount to really just a daily torrent of abuse and harassment and threats and really no place for them to turn. So what we're trying to do, large scale, bring attention to this problem, start thinking about creative answers to it. Specifically with revenge porn, we're trying to get criminal laws passed in every state, and we're hoping that there'll be a federal law passed as well to make it a crime that to intentionally disclose those types of intimate images of someone without their consent. All right, thank you. Thank you for the overview. So, so starting with, I mean, I, there was something that you said in there that struck me, and I, I've looked a little bit at the um, Cyber Civil Rights Initiative's website, mm -hmm. which is that, so you're taking really a holistic approach to this. Mm -hmm. And That's right. um, one of the things that jumps out, at, actually literally jumps out in um, Amanda's article um, is a block quote that says, critics of a new amendment to the Violence Against Women Act pulled out the trope that the internet is less real than other means of communication. Um, and I, I would have to agree that that is sort of the underlying issue here that that a lot of um, a lot of your opponents and a lot of the well and certainly you know the folks defending revenge porn which I can't wrap my head around um, are really kind of stuck in this idea that you know oh it's just words words won't hurt you it's just the internet mm -hmm. what do you say to that I think that that's people who say that are without knowing it I think that they're really indulging in a luxury that many people do not have, many people cannot afford. People who say that it's words only or that it's less real than, than real life, I think 
either haven't experienced this type of abuse themselves or they are somewhat cynically exploiting a kind of double-edged situation. So you find many people praising the internet precisely because it has this tremendous potential, this capacity to let people do more than they ever could before. It has really democratized the whole notion of social discourse. You don't have to find an outlet, you know, maybe prove yourself, go through all these hoops to get a stage, to get a platform. You can really do it yourself in many respects. And that is a very powerful thing. At the same time that people recognize how powerful that is, when it comes to regulating any of the negative side of this potential, many people suddenly back up and say, oh, but the internet's not really real. And that just isn't, that's very disingenuous. If you can recognize the fact that part of what makes the internet so powerful and so interesting and so wonderful in many respects is the fact that it does have this tremendous capacity to change the way that we communicate with each other, we have to also be honest about the fact that that is an extremely powerful and very real, very tangible medium. And for many of us, especially in the States, the internet is not some place that we go sometimes. It's not some gaming uh, platform that we have. It's really where people live out many, uh, much of their lives. So if we can recognize that, if we understand how important it is for people who are blogging, who are writing news articles, who are having any kind of internet presence, who are emailing, who are on Twitter, which is a lot of people for you know, a huge part of their lives, it just doesn't make any sense to say that it's less real. In many ways, it's more real because people spend more time online than they do offline in many ways. And also because, this is something we can talk about in more detail, but because the impact of someone harassing you online is actually, for, from victim's perspective, much worse or much more meaningful, much more um, negative than it would be even if receiving, even if you were receiving one letter or one phone call. Uh, those types of intimidation, that type of harassment that has always existed, is always troubling for victims. But at, at least you could say, well, you know, no one else heard this. No one else can hear the things that these people are saying about me. You now have these online platforms which allow people to torment other people in front of others and to basically track them, to stalk them online. This is where the concept of cyber stalking comes from. Follow them wherever they go. And now they don't have to do it physically. They don't have to put themselves at any risk. They don't have to drop a letter in the mail. They don't have to put their fingerprints on anything. They can just hound you all across the internet and they can hide behind anonymity. And to argue that that somehow is less harmful or that's less of a problem, I don't think makes any sense. Okay, right. So, I mean, looking, I, and I, I agree with all of that sentiment, and looking at the some of the work that you've done and some of the laws, or some of the language of the laws being proposed, you know, on face, I would jump in and agree, but then digging into it a little bit, I obviously, as a free speech advocate, start to get concerned, particularly when it comes to um, some of the language around um, CDA 230. And again, for the for those listening who aren't as familiar, um, CDA 230, Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act, um, essentially protects um, uh, web hosts, um, so content hosts, content providers, from uh, liability for third-party content. And that's the, the basic overview. There's uh, There are exceptions to that, and we can, you know, we don't need to get into detail. You guys can look it up out there. Um, but, you know, when it comes to that, I mean, I, you know, we're, I do a lot of work around trying to um, uh, work on intermediary liability protections in other countries. You know, we've seen, and, and so I should also say, for your sake too, um, a lot of my work is actually outside of the U.S. And so a lot of this, the legal stuff here is new to me. Um, but, you know, when I look at some of the intermediary liability related cases um, in recent history around the world, you know, one of the biggest ones that comes to mind is um, a case from Thailand where uh, a female editor of a um, uh, news, local news blog site um, was, you know, charged and almost went to prison. She ended up um, getting, you know, she ended up being acquitted, but almost went to prison for um, comments that were left on articles. Not that she had written, she had had nothing to do with it, but as an editor, um, she was involved in the production. And so I, I understand why people are concerned about pulling back at all on CDA 230. I mean, what, how would you address those fears that people have? Yeah, and I think they're very important fears that the, the conversation that we tend to have around CDA 230 is really the same conversation that we're having about the First Amendment generally, I think, in the offline context. And it's always a question of line drawing, the concerns about will regulation mean uh, chilling certain forms of speech? Is it going to have this negative impact on free and open discourse? And those are all very serious concerns. The problem that I've seen is that instead of trying to embrace those concerns and say, okay, this is a hard issue, we need to be extremely careful about what we do, we tend to see a lot of 
it has to be this or it has to be that, which is it either is all or nothing. This kind of harassment has to exist. Um, otherwise, we're going to kill the Internet. Um, you have to allow women to be threatened online. Otherwise, there'll be no such thing as free speech online. And I think those positions just don't make any sense. They don't make sense in the offline world. They don't make sense anywhere. It is, of course, true to say that you can go overboard with regulation and that when it comes to the Internet, especially because it is such an important medium for free speech, that we have to be very, very careful about not creating unintended consequences here. But that, that's all it really means is we need to be smart and we need to be careful. It doesn't mean that we can be apathetic or pretend as though the very freedoms, if you want to call it that, that are allowed for or indulged online aren't curbing other people's freedoms. It's really important to see this as not a, it's not an equal distribution of harms and benefits. When we talk about harassment of any group online, especially when it becomes so serious that you can actually see the effects of that group leaving or withdrawing from certain forms of communication, we have to start talking about how maybe what's going on here is free speech is the benefits of free speech are accruing for an elite and that for a less favored section of the population, things are actually being taken away. If we think about what so, these, yeah, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, 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 it's okay. No, I mean, I, you know, again, this is one of those things where I'm, I'm finding myself nodding my head, but then when I think about some of the examples that I've seen in the rest of the world, and I'll give you one, I mean, I, you probably know already that um, the Knesset in Israel um, just banned revenge porn about the, mm -hmm. a week ago. Um, and that's a country that doesn't have any strong intermediary liability protections. And in fact, a few years ago, um, I, I feel like I'm going to get this wrong because I, I just thought of it and I don't have it in front of me. So apologies again to the audience. Um, but a few years ago, there was a, a case where um, there was an attempt to ban, I think what it was, was basically anything that was supporting um, a boycott of Israel. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of Israeli sites were very concerned about this. Some of the more leftist sites were, you know, concerned that they would be held liable for the comments left on their blogs. And in fact, one of the most popular um, sort of leftist sites actually closed their, their comment section entirely um, because of that threat. And I mean, I would call that absolutely a chill on free speech as well as, um, you know, sort of a, it seemed in that case that minorities were absolutely being targeted, Palestinian mm -hmm. minorities, uh, leftist Israelis, etc. Um, and so that seems like, you know, a, a situation where intermediary liability, in fact, um, you know, kind of crush the people that that we're you know that you're talking about trying to protect. I mean, not not exactly the same people, obviously, mm -hmm. but um, so this is where I you know I'm I'm really skeptical there. I mean, I I hear you, and I I, I feel I feel like I you know I want to agree, like I said, but I I still you know it just becomes such a slippery slope so fast, and I don't see any way to ensure that CDA 230 is otherwise upheld while also um, I mean I don't see any way through through these means anyway. And I wonder if there's, you know, as I said before, as you've noted, um, you know, your organization is taking a holistic approach. And I wonder if there are better ways of handling this societally rather than potentially threatening speech. Sure, and I'd sound a note of, a note of caution here, partly because this is not a new conversation that we're having. One of the right. things that uh, Amanda's article was so good at explaining or, or put in context is that it's not a coincidence that this is the same conversation that was had over sexual harassment laws when they first became part of the anti-discrimination uh, norm in the United States or the aspirational norm that we had. Same kinds of arguments were being said. If you, if you stop people from making sexist comments in the workplace, from engaging in sexist bargaining, you're going to destroy workplaces. You're going to destroy schools. They're supposed to be these free and open exchanges, and people should be allowed to joke and to whatever it is they want to do all the time. And it's going to destroy, you know, free thinking, free speech, speech all of it, if we have anything like these anti-discrimination laws. And it wasn't just the sexual harassment laws. It was also racial discrimination laws. We, we heard the same response. And I'm not trying to say that there's not something true about that response. It is true that if you regulate something, obviously some speech is going to get, is going to simply become too costly to engage in. That's true. The problem is we as a society have decided that certain forms of speech aren't too costly to engage in. And that's why we have laws that say it really isn't worth your while to engage in this type of speech because it is actually eroding certain important norms of equality, dignity, anti-discrimination. And when it becomes that serious, that's necessary. We wouldn't have to do any of this if it weren't for the fact that people take advantage of free and open exchanges of ideas to torment, harass, discriminate, and, and ruin other people's lives. So it is a shame that we have to have any of these.
No one should celebrate the fact that we have to have laws against discrimination. It shouldn't be something that a, a dignified society ever had to do, but we all know that it needed to, I think. I think we've come to some rough consensus about the fact that anti-discrimination laws are important because they address something that's so corrosive to society that it needs to be, uh, that we need to take the drastic step of actually having the law step in. So that isn't to say that all of this maps perfectly onto the online context. For many reasons, it doesn't. But I want to make sure that we understand that we're not reinventing the wheel here. After you had all this alarmist reaction to sexual harassment laws and discrimination laws, I don't think anybody can really plausibly say that the workplace has just become this you know, horribly sanitized context in which people can't ever speak their minds. Uh, and I think the same thing would be true about online harassment or online spaces. They're not going to suddenly be on lockdown because there are some regulations of the worst successes of harassing or defamatory or whatever the case may be forms of speech. So when we talk about slippery slopes, it's important to note that we're, we're speaking within a context already. The status quo has already stacked certain certain things against certain groups and not others. The slippery slope is not just about this one group or any group having fewer rights, uh, fewer and fewer rights because there are more and more regulations. It's also about the fact that those laws are put in place because there are certain groups and certain individuals who are constantly being undermined, whose rights are being taken away. So a slippery slope analogy d d doesn't express the fact that there are people whose rights at this moment, by this supposedly um, indifferent approach that we're taking, what we're saying, we're really not going to regulate much speech online, that approach means that many people are going to suffer. It's not as though there's no cost to the way we're doing it now. So the question really is, how can we renegotiate those costs so that you don't have the worst successes of really bad speech while not taking away the important rights for people to have some measure of anonymity, some measure of freedom to speak uh, in online forums and other and others. So I think that's it's it's just a little frustrating, I think, for victims to hear, well, it's a slippery slope. But what about the fact that the status quo itself is every day inflicting certain harms on a group of people? so that it almost could be said that the benefits of free speech are only really elitist benefits. They're only going to a certain group at the expense of another group. And if that's what it is, then it's not really free speech. It really is just favoring the few or favoring a certain group over the rights and dignity of another. I'm not sure I totally agree with that. I mean, I, I hear what you're saying, but when you, know, you, know, when you say uh, you know, how the victims, I forget, I can't quote you exactly, I'm sorry, I'm terrible at that. Um, but, you know, it, that it's hard for victims to hear that it's a slippery slope when, etc. I mean, I I worry that, so let's move on to a different um, example and something very related to this, but where I, I think is a little bit more in my domain because I get a little, little nervous around the laws. Um, so one of the other things that's been proposed, and I don't know where you stand on this, but um, we've seen a lot of different proposals, and particularly earlier this year with Facebook, um, for intermediaries such as Facebook, Google Plus, uh, other social networks, et cetera, Twitter, um, to take a stronger approach by banning certain types of speech. Um, and that's a case where, you know, I'm a little more comfortable in this area. I've done a lot of work on this topic um, where I think that it's a fundamental threat to speech for these intermediaries to to take on a stronger stance um, in banning, you know, different types of content. And so while there was a, um, an effort earlier, or I guess last year now at this point, we're in January, um, an effort last year to get Facebook to ban um, rape jokes and other um, really just awful speech promoting violence against women, um, you know, that was another thing where I really wanted to be on board, but where I've seen the damage that Facebook censorship, um, and I know we're talking about censorship not in the context of the law, of course, but I'm going to use it for this purpose, um, where Facebook censorship has done a lot of harm to people in certain places. Um, and I can give a few examples of that, but I guess first I, I should ask you, where, where do you stand on that approach? Well, I think it's a really interesting approach because, as you say, this is the, the question of what private companies can and should do with their own policies is a really interesting one because we do tend to conflate the notion of censorship with state censorship and private censorship, which they're obviously not the same thing at all. And I think right. that because we have, we're now raising several generations to believe that they're entitled to certain private spaces, because really when you're on Facebook, it's not some public right that you're afforded. It's not something that the state has done for you. You don't have that as a right. It's something that there's a company that can profit from it or likes to do business this way and, and you get to take advantage of that. But no one's entitled to, to, have, to say what they want to on Facebook. No one's entitled to say what they want to on their blog. These are all, this is a network of, uh, private companies engaging in certain policies and not others. And sometimes they benefit us and sometimes they don't. So what I think, again, you know, this is somewhat similar to the 
previous comments I made that we again have to think about what is the status quo composed of. It's not, what really frustrated a lot of people about Facebook and its policy or non-policy towards these awful, misogynist, violent sites was that Facebook does engage in censorship all the time. Uh, if you have pictures of women breastfeeding, they come down right away. There's all sorts of things that they take seriously. Most forms of really serious racial discrimination, they took down almost immediately. What was glaringly missing from the things that Facebook tried as it's on its own initiative to take seriously was anything targeted at women. That is, I think that's a really good example of what people are frustrated about because there's no such thing as a non-censorship stance. Every company, every government, every individual engages in censorship. It's only a question of whether they are applying that censorship consistently or not. Facebook has all kinds of policies about privacy, about, about uh, defamation, about hate speech, about all these things, but they left out the idea, apparently, or they didn't seem to think that it was right to apply these when it came to groups and ads and pages that were targeted, uh, that were based on violence against women. That's what was frustrating. So I can see somebody saying, look, I want a Facebook where they don't censor anything. That's fair, but I don't know that that is a Facebook that has ever existed or that anybody genuinely wants to exist because I think that's going to be a pretty frightening thing. And no company is perfect. Um, <laughs> No, I'm laughing because that, that has been my stance, um, where I, mean, I completely agree with you, but the precedent, of course, is that, and, you know, I understand, I mean, I've had, I did that debate a couple of times last summer with Saraya Shamali mm -hmm. and a couple of other people where, you know, the, the point was, my point was that, well, yeah, of course, but of course Facebook censors, but I would prefer it not, and I can give you hundreds of reasons as to why. I mean, you know, for example, in the run-up to this, I actually tried, um, Facebook has implemented a new reporting feature where it actually updates you as to the progress of reports that you've made, which I think came on the heels of that particular effort. So that's a, I think it's a really positive thing um, to at least have a little bit more transparency in their reporting. But I tested it out last week on a couple of Al-Qaeda pages, and they wouldn't take them down. Um, and so Facebook is still absolutely, um, you know, just sort of all over the map when it comes to what they will take down and what they won't, which was mm -hmm. the point that a lot of people were making last summer anyway, was that, okay, well, if you're taking down, you know, violence against um, a certain other minority group, or you're taking down pages of, of women breastfeeding, which I think is absurd, of course, um, then of course you should do this too. And I think within that context, it makes sense to me. But I, you know, with a billion people using the service uh, mm -hmm. all over the world, it really concerns me that we're taking or that the site is taking a particularly American approach, you know, where sex is bad, violence is fine. I can't help but see it as a set of scales where, you know, the criminalization of revenge porn solves one problem, but then on the other side, could potentially, and I realize, you know, it is potentially, it's not definitively, um, could potentially create all of these other problems. And I think that, you know, that's, I think that's probably a fair assessment of how a lot of um, free speech advocates see this as, okay, yes, we do want to do something. And I mean, I, you know, I personally have, you know, been the victim of sexual harassment online. You know, I've been on the internet since I was 11. I, I can assure you that that's, <laughs> it is true, the lived experience of being a woman on the internet. And I, I don't think that any women are really disagreeing with that. Um, but, you know, I still, that whole other basket of all of the other things that this could potentially bring up, I have to kind of, you know, weigh my hands and go, is this worthwhile for, I mean, when I, you know, for the, I don't want to say the limited satisfaction that it brings, but I, you know, this is the internet. Once something's out there, it's out there. And we're all familiar with the Streisand effect. And I'm certainly not defending it. And this is what's so hard about it. But look at it and I go, okay, if I were to go after somebody who had harassed me, what's done is done. What is it worth the risk? I think is what I'm trying to say here. And I, I know, I mean, it's hard. I do end up talking around it a lot because I go, okay, well, I do want to do something about this, but I am genuinely scared about the effects that this could have on speech. Uh, genuinely. I mean, this is not lip service for me. No, and I understand that. I, I really do recognize that there are, I mean, I, I think there are malicious actors and, uh, there are people who genuinely don't care about harassment. They really don't care about the effects that, that these types of harms have. I don't count the EFF as one of those organizations. I think they do genuinely care about these issues. So I think that's, there's, you know, the, there's different audiences to speak to as far as that goes. And I consider many of these privacy organizations to be on the same page with us in terms of recognizing that these are real harms. And as you pointed out, they're concerned about whatever steps we take in response to them being more costly or worse than the, the problem. So I, I do think that that's a serious issue, which is part of why at the Cyber Civil Rights Initiative, we don't just want to engage in 
sort of free-floating ideas about how, oh, we need to criminalize stuff that's bad. I, I don't think, especially as a law professor, I'm, what a part of what I try to teach my students is that you can't just you can't just respond to issues by criminalizing everything. That that sometimes is going to be a bad response. Right. Um, but there's also such a thing as having a real impact through law and law as a piece of society. Uh, it's not going to be the only response, but that it's going to work in tandem maybe with the way that private corporations will choose to enact their policies, the way that communities online can actually serve to change norms, adjust norms if they want to. But to the specific question of laws, this is why we're asking them to come and talk to us about the specific laws. It's not a vague proposition that we're putting in front of any of these institutions and saying, so what do you think generally about getting rid of this content? Because that's that's a ridiculous conversation to have. And we all know that the devil right. is in the details and that by saying, oh, I want to criminalize revenge porn, the law that could be written could be really terrible. And we've actually seen that in several cases. Part of what we do or what I, I try to do as a when I'm advising legislative drafters is to avoid bad laws. I, I'm as invested as anyone is, is in making sure that we have good laws that comply with the Constitution, not just because I don't want these laws to be declared unconstitutional, but also because I care about free speech uh, also. So what we've done in these cases is we've, part of our work, which I think the media doesn't pick up as much, is I, I tell legislators when they give me a draft of something that says you cannot use naked images to annoy anybody, I tell them that is not a good law. That is an incredibly bad law because it's very vague and it's going to be applied in all kinds of circumstances that are actually going to chill genuine uh, useful speech. So part of our job is to say, look, let's be very specific about what kind of content we're trying to prohibit. Let's make sure that this has to be intentional behavior as opposed to accidental behavior. Let's make sure that we have clear exceptions that will not apply to uh, law enforcement activity or certain forms of journalistic activity. We want good laws We and we want advocates, we want experts, we want people who are good at understanding what a good law is versus a bad law to help us in this because that's what we really want to have happen and not and it's not lip service to free speech it's genuinely because we care about making sure that we have as free of a society as we can without having to take as the cost of doing business that scores of women thousands of women whatever the case may be or other minorities sexual minorities racial minorities that not burdening them with harassment with threats with with actions that will keep them offline so we're really just trying to get we're, we're trying to get smart people to help us in this project write the best definitions make sure that we have good exceptions so that we do this difficult challenging important work of trying to regulate the bad stuff and keep as much of the good stuff in that's what we'd really like to see happen good i well i appreciate that and i you know i mean i think i think it's really important because if i can if i can draw a parallel example just again for the sake of the audience i mean one of the things that's been really disheartening to me over the past few years is that um private companies in their efforts to legitimately of course tackle um, child sexual abuse images or child pornography as it's more commonly known um have actually created just bans on nude images even on private cloud servers and so if you use like microsoft skydrive you can't store nude images on there mm -hmm. and of course we i think we agree that there are legitimate reasons to have nude images whether they're artistic or whatever in nature um but so and, you know you're basically we're, we're coming to an internet where you can't even store your own private images on a private server because of the software that's being used to try to tackle child pornography so i appreciate the the attempts to ensure that um you know that this is a limited um set of legislation um since we're running out of time i want to ask you two more things and i am sure that will um that it'll take a little bit of time but i've got two things that i one one big question and then another positive note to end on um so the first one is since we just hadn't tackled this yet how what is your take on um some of the vigilante I don't want to say vigilante justice, but yeah, vigilante justice that's been undertaken um, on behalf of women who have su suffered abuse on the internet. Um, and, you know, I mean, I think from my perspective, I'll just say this outright, you know, I, I obviously I can't cheer on anonymous when they go after causes, but at the same time, you know, I've looked at, you know, I've looked in the U.S. at like the way anonymous has gone after Visa and uh, MasterCard in response to WikiLeaks. And to that, I kind of to be honest, rolled my eyes a little bit saying, oh, you have other paths of recourse. But then when Anonymous and some other groups went after um, Syrian government websites, I found myself kind of secretly cheering inside, even though I know that the CFAA is so broad that it could potentially prosecute people even for that. Um, and so when we look at some of the, the um, instances in the past year, I mean, what, what are your thoughts on that? 
that's a it's a huge huge complicated issue and i'm i'm really glad that you it brought is. it up and i'm glad that you brought it up in this context because i think a lot of times when people wonder or they they talk about the vigilante issue it's it's very black and white for people they either think it's great or they think it's terrible and i think the answer has got to be it's sometimes it's great and sometimes it's terrible and i think that um that's exactly what you just expressed is is the is the problem and the, the benefit right that you have on the one hand uh, sometimes and this is true about vigilantes generally when you have a broken system sometimes vigilantes are all you've got that's kind of the, the only way to deal with the fact that in some societies we're not taking certain crimes seriously or we're not actually ensuring that certain uh, parts of the population aren't being oppressed so whose job you know who is actually going to speak for the oppressed if it's not going to be vigilantes if the state has utterly failed in its attempt to protect its own citizens that's why you have vigilantes. At the same time, you also have vigilantes whose intentions are bad or just not that effective or just confusing or any number of other things because they also don't tend to be experts. They don't tend to always have a nuanced view of what the issues are. So the give and take there is, I think that I, I too find myself looking at some of the things, even within one, one topic, not even going from one topic to the next about what Anonymous does or doesn't do, but within the sexual crimes context, it is important to remember that there were members of, or at least calling themselves, and that's another issue, right? Who is anonymous and who actually gets to count as one of their <laughs> members, but but who themselves engage in things like revenge porn and rape threats and actually made many women's lives miserable. And then a few years ago, there seemed to be this kind of change of heart and that you found that more often than not, if they were being reported in connection with a sexual crime, they were on the right side. They were actually trying to agitate for legal investigations, which I, you know, as especially as a response this this kind of pushing along the law i think is actually a pretty nuanced response on the part of a any vigilante group so that again tells you is it going to shift the other way is the, tomorrow are they going to attack victims are they going to do something else one doesn't know the benefit as far as i can tell is not just that sometimes they get it right because of course that's going to be counterbalanced with all the times they get it wrong uh, and that includes getting the right. wrong person right i mean some of the the more grave missteps has been that they have dragged a lot of people through the internet mud as it were that were not guilty of anything or at least not guilty of what they were accused of being guilty of what i think is interesting and important and useful about the presence of vigilante efforts is it changes the certainty with which some people have uh, about their ability to engage in malicious activity. It now makes it ambiguous. It makes it uncertain that if you were to attack somebody, if you're trying to oppress someone, is the internet mob, as it were, going to be on your side or not? I think it's a fairly safe thing to say that 10 years ago, if you wanted to be a bad person online, if you wanted to attack someone, you really wanted to take someone out, the internet hordes were going to support you because they just enjoyed that. That's the, the era of 4chan. And, and that was something that you could really rely on the anonymous users of, of uh, many anonymous users to kind of come to your defense and let you do this. The Michael Birch case, the Reddit, the Reddit case, Violent Acres case was one of those types of things. You get protected by the, by the internet. Then you have this turnaround where at least some of the time, the vigilantes, the hackers, whoever it was, were on the other side. So now you don't know what they're going to say on that side, but what you what you get from that is this uncertainty and i think it's a productive uncertainty that if you're going to engage in bad behavior you might not have the internet hordes on your side they might be coming after you so i think that's useful that it makes the cost more more equally distributed across society than it used to be i think it used to be that bad people on the internet really had everything in their favor and now it's not clear that they do and i think that's an important power shift and these types of vigilantes have done a lot to affect that Great. So I'm going to I'm going to close that on a positive question, because as far as I see, this past year has been huge in raising awareness of online sexual harassment um, and and online misogyny in general, even the I don't want to say innocuous, but the the more, um, you know, just opinion stuff like, um, you know, you've had a couple of uh, Silicon Valley types. I'm not going to name names, but we all know who I'm talking about um, <laughs> tweeting really just awful things and having a whole bunch of people um, attack them and deservedly so, perhaps. Um, and so, and you know, from that to the campaign to get Facebook to um, 
to take a stronger approach. Even if one does not agree that Facebook should be in the business of that, it, that campaign nevertheless raised awareness in an incredible way. And, you know, I know that old adage to never read the comments, but lately I've been reading the comments <laughs> and I found a surprising number of, you know, like Lindy West wrote an article a few nights ago that I, yeah. I disagreed with bits of it, but then I went down and looked in the comments and I saw several men saying, oh my God, I had no idea that this is what women went through. Yeah. And, I'm imagining that that sort of comment probably existing across a number of these articles over the past year. And so, you know, do you think that some of the the um, the efforts to raise societal awareness are working at this point? I mean, I, I, know, I know and I know that you would probably not think that they're working to the point of, of you know, dropping the idea of legislation. You might be right. But in the broader sense, are we are we making any change? I think we, we, we clearly are. I mean, I do think the those of us who have been around a little bit longer, I think, than some of the people who are having the conversation who've seen the internet go through several transformations. The And of course, it's always dangerous to speak of the internet as if it were one place, but I do think that you can say about general, general cultural shifts or, or norm shifts within the internet, I think we've absolutely seen those. I think the comment sections you're talking about, yes, I mean, these were places, even the, the fact that Lindy West is writing these articles and that she's on a site like Jezebel, which is read by so many people, I don't know what, what, what sort of predecessor they really had. I mean, 10 years ago, when I first started working on uh, online harassment issues, I don't know that there really were even these spaces you could speak of where women uh, or other minorities could, could just have a platform to actually talk about some of these things and have some support as opposed to being shot down immediately. So you've seen this just huge wave of all these incredibly good uh, websites where I think people genuinely are learning from each other, at least some of the time. It doesn't happen all the time, but it has this, I think, tremendous effect of saying that things that would have gone unnoticed or, or maybe not criticized or not widely criticized 10 years ago, now, this is, and this is the power of the internet, right, the democratizing potential, someone's going to tweet about it and someone's going to write about it on Jezebel, someone's going to write about it on Gawker, and then there's going to be a conversation that you wouldn't have had before. It doesn't mean that everybody arrives at the same conclusion at the end, nor should they, but it means that it's not that people have the same monopoly over ideas and, and comments that they used to have before. You really do see the positive forces of the internet in action and the positive forces are getting people to be part of the conversation and expressing their opinions without having to be shut down immediately or not, uh, not allowed to participate. So I think that you are definitely seeing that kind of change and it's a very positive, it's a very, very positive sign. I have to agree, and I, I mean, I, I hate to go too much into superlatives, but sometimes it feels like this is the best and the worst time to be a woman <laughs> on the internet. Um, yeah, I think that that's, that's fair, because I, I do remember, I mean, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, when I was first writing about a lot of these issues, it was an incredibly isolating experience, because my sense of the world was that there was no one else out there that, that thought about these issues uh, the same way that I was, that I... You know, these were little battles that you had to take on your own and you just had to deal with all the negativity and the lack of support. It's just not like that anymore. I mean, it's not perfect by any means. And we have seen, I think, what, what could be characterized as a backlash by um, all the, the, the forms of harassment that we're seeing. But these spaces just didn't exist before. This, this mode of communication and this mode of at least sometimes solidarity did not exist before. And I think it, it's, it's a tremendously exciting time to be alive. It really is. And that's, it's, it's both nerve wracking and gratifying just to see the kinds of changes that are happening. And that's partly why the, the women, especially who are speaking out against harassment and discrimination are, they're coming at it from a place of saying, this could be such a good thing. There are so many good things about this way of communicating with, with each other. Can't we make sure that we're not driving certain people out of it? I think that's really where it's coming from. It's, it's by no means an anti-internet, anti-social media stance. It's, no, we see all the good things and we want to preserve the good things and not have them undermined by all the bad. Well, thank you. I think we're, we're reaching an hour, but thank you so much for this discussion. I mean, this has given me a lot to think about, and I think it's really good to to kind of bridge these gaps and, and talk about where, you know, I, I, basically, you know, what I'm seeing is a lot of um, one side saying these things, one side saying these things, and not a whole lot of crossing. And, but you were right before when you said that, you know, I think we agree on more than we disagree on. And so um, thank you again so much.